the uh, thank you very much so the next speaker is Carl Brinkman from MPI and is, is going to speak about set based uh, lower bounds uh, uh, for subset sum and by criteria path and uh, so let, let me remind once again if you have uh, questions please write them in the chat and we'll, uh, we will ask them to the speaker at the end so please Carl okay hi uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Uh, then let me talk about uh, set-based lower bound for subset sums. This is joint work with Amir Boot, Daniel Hermelin, and Tvia Shaptai. So you all know the subset sum problem, given a set X of n positive integers, like this set here. We want to, and given a target T, we want to know whether some subset of X sums to T. And in this example here, yes, there exists a subset that sums to the target of 90. Uh, throughout the talk, I will assume that X is really a set, sometimes assumed to be a multi-set. So this is mostly to simplify some asymptotic notation because then I can assume that N is at most T. Now subset sum is maybe the most uh, fundamental NP complete problem at the intersection of theoretical computer science, optimization and operations research. It draws its importance mainly because it's a special case of so many other problems. So is, uh, you can prove NP hardness of many other problems because subset sum is a special case of that. And another uh, importance is that it's, uh, well, it comes up in modern crypto as the uh, short integer solution problem, which is basically some variant of subset sum. This is one more modern um, motivation to study this problem. Now in the talk, I will focus on the pseudo-polynomial time regime of this problem, uh, which is basically about this classic Bellman's algorithm that well, we, we present in undergrad classes to teach dynamic programming, right? Uh, where, uh, so what is the algorithm? You build this huge table where the entry at i comma s uh, is one or zero, depending on whether some subset of the first i integers sums to s. And then you can fill each table into in constant time. So you can fill the whole table in time proportion to its size, which is time order n times t. Now we teach this in Android classes. So obviously we can, we should ask ourselves whether well, the algorithm that we present is uh, somehow close to optimal or whether it can be improved a lot. And lots of people worked on this problem. Um, so for example, if you work on a red run problem, then it's if you work on a, in the word one model where you can handle W bits at once, then it's long known that you can shave off a factor W from this running time. And the first real breakthrough was five years ago by Kiliaris and Xu, who showed that you can actually get running time square root n times t up to log factors. And then sometime later, I showed that you can get rid of uh, uh, the, this factor n in, uh, completely, and you can re replace it by just logarithmic terms in terms of P and N. And the big difference is that my algorithm is randomized, or the previous algorithms were deterministic, so the fastest deterministic still is the square root N times T. And a little bit later, um, Jin and Bu uh, improved the log factors even further, and uh, now it's running time T log T. Okay, so you can actually shave off this factor N. Subset sum is in randomized time O tilde of T. Um, so then obviously we can ask whether this running time is now optimal or whether we can prove a conditional lower bound ruling out faster running times. Um, subset sum has been, uh, has been the target of uh, basically all the lower bound approaches that we have, or they, all of them have been studied at subset sum. So very classically, if your axiom is that P is not equal to P, meaning that satisfiability is not in polynomial time, then you can use our classic notions of reductions, right, to prove super polynomial lower bounds for many other problems. So for example, you can show that subset sum is not in polynomial time. And here this means that it's not in time polynomial of n and log t, because all the input numbers can be specified using log t bits. So the input size is in n times log t, essentially. Okay, so this is what you get from the classic axiom that P is not equal to NP. Now, um, some 20 years ago, Pagliazzo and Paturi came up with stronger 
axioms, stronger hypotheses. Um, first of all, the strong exponential time hypothesis, which states that satisfiability is not in time two to a little of n. And if you combine this with the usual notion of reduction, then you can actually show many lower bounds that are tied up to the constant in the exponent. And in particular, for subset, some people did this. Uh, Burman et al. and Jensen et al. Uh, independently showed that subset sum cannot be solved in running time e to the little of 1 times 2 to the little of n. Okay, so this is height for this running time of uh, t up to the constant in the exponent. So it could still be, let's say, running time root square root of t. Uh, so let's go one step further and look at the strong exponential time hypothesis, which, which roughly speaking states that satisfiability is not in time 1.999 to the n. More precisely, it's stating this here that for any epsilon, there is a k such that k set cannot, cannot be solved in time 2 to the 1 minus epsilon n. Okay, so if you use this axiom with this usual setup, then you can actually show lower bounds that are tied with the correct constant in the exponent. And in this work, we show such a lower bound for subset sum. Namely, we show that it is not in time t to the one minus epsilon times two to the little of n. Okay, so this is, gives a tight lower bound for this running time t for the pseudopolynomial setting. Let me just mention that the exponential time setting is still widely open. So for this 2 to the n over 2 running time for subset sum, we do not know yet whether this is optimal. Okay, so that's, the, that's what I mentioned so far. Uh, subset sum is in time O tilde of t. And um, we show this kind of matching lower bound, mainly that if you want a sublinear running time in terms of t, then you have to pay an exponential factor in n. One way of reading this, reading this lower bound it's based on the standard axiom from fine-grained complexity, the strong exponential time hypothesis. Good. Um, before I give a little bit of proof ideas, let me, uh, let me tell you about some applications of this result. The first one is for or subset sum. Um, so this is a variant of the problem where we're given a bunch of subset sum instances, and we want to know whether at least one of these instances is a yes instance. So we get, here we are given Q instances. Um, let's say N is the maximum number of items of any of these instances. T is the maximum target. And naively, well, you naively can just solve all of these instances independently. Each one you can solve in time O tilde of T. So your running time is T times Q. Now what we show is that um, this naive running time is essentially optimal. Uh, or more precisely, uh, if you want to reduce the running time to t times q to the one minus epsilon, then you have to pay an exponential factor in n. This even holds if you, you, if you specify the, how q should grow in terms of t. So I can choose some constant gamma and then q should behave as t to the gamma and this lower bound still holds. Okay, so essentially this naive running time is optimal. Um, wait for our subset sum. Now, um, now, how do you prove such a, low, such a low bound for a problem with many instances? Now, the typical way to do so is uh, to do this via self-reduction. So uh, for a minute, le let's look at the satisfiability problem again. Seems like we lost Carl. I don't know if others can hear him. Yeah. Um, no, we can't. Maybe a connection problem. Um, Siv is trying to get connected again. But...
So I see that somebody else with that name joined. I assume that he's joining again. With another account. So, yeah. Okay. So shall we so, make him? Uh, I think. Yes. Call? Yes. I. I. I did, he's a co-host oh. now. I, I assume that he is going to go ahead and share again. Uh, Hi. Can you I'll hear me now? Oh. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, so so please go ahead and share again. Second. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, good, let me continue. Um, okay. Good. Okay. Uh, so here I was. Um, right. So we have for K sub we have this kind of self reduction. Uh, right. So how do you prove that solving many instances of K sub uh, is hard? Well, you use this kind of self reduction you push over R variables and you get two to the R sub problems. Uh, each with a smaller search space size of two to the n minus r. So if you could solve the or of all these subproblems in time faster than the naive in time, faster than the number of subproblems times the search space size, then you would uh, refute the some strong exponential time hypothesis. So just uh, from the hardness of satisfiability and the self-reduction, we get that solving the or of many such instances is hard. Now for subset sum, we cannot use this argument directly. There, there is no simple self-reduction. Um, but what we can do now is to combine these two things. So let's start from a case that instance. Let's first do this self-reduction to get uh, some number Q of instances of case that. And then on each of these case that instances, we use the previous reduction that I mentioned that uh, we, well, the, the set hardness of subset sum is nothing else than reduction from k sub to subset sum. So we can turn each of these q instances of k sub into an instance of subset sum. And then we arrive at uh, q instances of subset sum and solving the or of these subset sum instances, which we solve the original k sub instance. So this way we get this kind of hardness for or subset sum. Right. Okay. Uh, let me mention another application, which is by criteria path. So um, right here, that's another optimization problem. Where we are given a directed graph G and each edge has a length and a cost. And we're given a source vertex Vs and a sink vertex Vt and a cost budget C. What we want to know is the, uh, is we want to know whether there is a, uh, or we want to compute the, source to sync path with total cost at most C and minimal total length. Once in time M times C, number of edges times the cost budget. Uh, and um, by criteria path is um, easily shown to be NP hard by a reduction from subset sum problem. So you just quickly sketch this reduction from subset sum. We're given a set X and target T for subset sum. We will turn this into a graph on N plus one vertices with a cost budget of T. And uh, this, this picture here is the whole reduction. And the leftmost one is the source, rightmost one is the sink. And then we have two parallel edges for each item in the subset sum instance. And the two parallel edges encode that you pick this item or do not pick this item. If you pick the item, you incur cost xi and length t minus xi. If you do not pick the item, you have cost zero and length t. So the, the different paths, different source to sync paths in this graph correspond to the subsets of the original set x. And such a path corresponding to subset y has cost exactly the, the, the sum of the items in y and length 
n times t minus the sum of the items in one. So if we set our cost budget to t, then well, we, uh, we can, the minimal length is n times t minus t, if and only if the subset sum instance was a yes instance. Okay, so an easy NPR hardness reduction. And because we showed this lower bound for subset sum, we now also get a nice lower bound for by criteria path. Namely, well, before we said that if you want sublinear time in the target, you need to pay an exponential factor on n. Now we get if you want sublinear time and the cost, but in the cost budget, then you need to pay an exponential factor on n. It's a similar lower bound for by criteria path as we have seen for subset sum. It's saying something about algorithms with sublinear running time in C. It's not saying anything about algorithms with linear time in C. So we don't know yet whether this M times C running time is optimal, or maybe we can get M plus C. Um, so now let me also rule out this. Um, and for this, um, well, we, you know, we reduced from this or subset sum problem that I mentioned before. So instead of just writing down this reduction for one instance, let me write it down for Q many instances. And let me put one new super source and one new super sink. And basically what this new, new, um, yeah, what, what this new um, instance here is encoding is, well, when, when is there a, a light path from the source to the sink? If there exists one of these instances for which there exists a subset of the items uh, that has small, uh, small total length. So if there exists a subset sum instance that is a yes instance, meaning that this or subset sum instance was a yes instance. So we're actually encoding or subset sum with this instance. And now um, well, you can check that the number of vertices that we create is Q times N, the cost budget is still T. Um, and if you would solve the, the created by criteria instance in running time proportional to the cost budget times sublinear number of vertices, then what you could get for our subset sum is T times Q times N to the minus epsilon, which well, you can check is faster than what we ruled out for our, our subset sum. So what we get is this kind of lower bound for by criteria path. Even if you have a linear dependence on the cost budget, can you, you need at least linear dependence on, on n as well. So you cannot get time t times n to the 1 minus epsilon. This almost mentioned that this almost almost matches the dynamic programming algorithm that I mentioned before. It does match it for sparse graphs. There's still a gap for dense graphs. Good. Um, so how much time do I have left now? Oh, actually quite a bit. Good, let me go to this one here then. Uh, so let me talk about the, the reduction to subset sum. So we want to, uh, we want to have a reduction from the satisfiability problem to the subset sum problem. Uh, in particular, this will show NP hardness of subset sum. So let me start with an NP hardness proof of subset sum, which, uh, well, this may be not the most standard proof of NP hardness, but it's some NP hardness proof of subset sum. Okay, so we are, start from, we are starting from a satisfiability instance, and I will construct some target number t. I will also construct some item for each variable and each assignment to that variable, so each variable x is one of the n variables and alpha is one bit that we can assign this variable to. And then I will also an assignment of this clause. Right? So every clause looks at some s variables, uh, some variables x1 to xs, which take some bits, uh, alpha 1 to alpha s, uh, so for each assignment to the variables that the clause is looking at, we create one, one item, but only if this is satisfying. Okay, now let's um, start with some higher order bits here. Um, so the target, uh, and the topmost bits of the target will just encode the number n plus m, and each of the items will have a number one. Uh, so this encodes that we have to choose exactly n plus m items. Now in the next couple of, and we will have, uh, in between we will have some uh, blocks of log n zeros just to 
void overflow from the from the next bit. Okay, so on the next bit block, um, the target will just have n plus m ones, and uh, an item corresponding to a variable x will have a, a one at the position corresponding to a variable x, and um, an item a clause item will have a one at the position corresponding to that clause. Now, what is this? This encode. This encodes that we. We actually have to choose one item for each variable and one item for each class, right? Because if you pick two items for, let's say, for the same variable, then you have two ones at the same position. So these cancel out, you get a carry one, but then you get less than n plus m ones in these blocks. So if you want exactly n plus m ones in these blocks and choose n plus m items in total, then you have to pick one item for each variable. Now at this point, we choose an assignment for each variable and we choose a satisfying assignment for each clause. So are we done here? Well, not really, right? Because they don't have to be consistent yet. You could choose any assignments to these clauses that don't have to be consistent with the chosen assignments for the variables. So let's make this consistent now. Uh, so I will have one more block for each variable. And if a clause, uh, if a clause reads that variable, then it will just write the corresponding assignment that it thinks that this uh, that this variable has. It will write the assignment alpha i to the block. Now uh, the the item uh, yeah the item corresponding to variable x um, writes either zero or dx depending on what it what what its, its assignment is. So uh, dx is the number of clauses that read this variable. And it writes uh, dx if the assignment is uh, zero and zero if the assignment is one. And then well, what we want to see in this block in total is just dx. So what happens here if the variable is uh, if if the variable item assigns uh, the value of zero, then we already have dx in this block. So all the clauses also must assign zero. Otherwise, we would get a different value than dx. Similarly, the other way. So we, we enforce consistency. Okay, so now we pick an assignment for each variable, a satisfying assignment for each clause, and these assignments are consistent, meaning that uh, we encoded the satisfiability problem in subset Um Okay, so that's an NP hardness proof. Um, what do we want to turn this into a Seth hardness proof? We want that the total number of bits that we create here is just one plus epsilon times n. Why do we want this? Because now, uh, because if we get this, then uh, a running time of the forum t to the one minus order epsilon times two to the little of n would violate the strong exponential time hypothesis. Because, well, if you plug in one plus epsilon n, um, as log t, then you get something that is faster than two to the n. Okay, so we want that the number of bits is very close to n. Uh, we don't have this yet, right? Uh, what we do have here is n plus m bits basically for the two first um, bit blocks. And then we get something like n times log of the degree of each variable for, for the remaining bit blocks. That's uh, a bit larger. <clears throat> so we, 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 let me just tell you about the three ingredients that we use to, to reduce the number of bits. First one is the sparsification lemma. So that's one of the standard tools in these kinds of set-based lower bounds. Basically, it allows you to assume that the number of clauses is linear and that each variable appears in a linear number of clauses. If I go back to this slide, then, um, log t is now order n because the number of classes is linear and the degree of each uh, variable is constant. Order n gives us an exponential time-based ETH-based lower bound, not yet an SETH-based lower bound, so we need some more ingredients. One of them is to block variables to, to larger super variables. Um, right, and this basically uh, ensures that, uh, well, the, the these dummy bits that we have in the first two blocks here is reduced to some epsilon n 
because now we just have epsilon n super variables and epsilon n super clauses. Uh, one issue is that we now have variables over a larger domain. And over a larger domain, this consistency constraint is harder to get. And let me just quickly mention that um, the right consistency con constraint to choose here is this, um, are these D sum free sets from additive combinatorics. What is a D sum free set? Well, the set S is D sum free if whenever you pick any numbers X1 through XD and X in S, if X1 through XD sum up to D times X, then they all have to be the same already. This is called a D sum free set. Uh, and there is this classic uh, construction due to Behrendt, which constructs these kinds of sets um, of basically linear size. And then um, if you plug in these kinds of uh, um, sum free sets as consistency constraint into this reduction, then you get what we, what we want. Uh, but let me conclude here. Um, okay, so I've told you about subset sum, that it can be, that this n times t algorithm can be improved to randomize time t times log vectors. And assuming the strong exponential time hypothesis, this is basically optimal. I also told you about a couple of applications, this or subset sum and by criteria path. Um, there's already this nice separation between subset sum and by criteria path, right? Because for subset sum, we could shave off this factor n. But by criteria path, we show that you cannot shave off this factor n. But we still leave a gap for these dense graphs. Um, in the paper, we also look at k-sum and uh, show similar bounds for the k-sum problem. And, um, a pseudo polynomial time algorithm for KSUM is also optimal. And then, um, well, after this work, um, uh, it's already a couple of years on the archive. Um, uh, and because uh, it's a natural to, to study the same kind of lower bounds for all these extensions, like integer linear programming, modular variants of subset sum, approximation schemes of subset sum, and so on. Um, for, for many of these, uh, you show hardness um, just based on a simple uh, reduction from subset sum. So now you can check whether the, um, whether the fine-grained results for subset sum that we have here already give tight bounds for these other regimes, or whether there has to be more work to also prove tight bounds in, for these other variants. Uh, and this is uh, ongoing work that has been done by many, many problems, uh, by many persons. Um, right, so let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Carl. And uh, again, I don't see questions. Um, I guess people are a bit shy with this new <laughs> way of uh, communicating. So, and we are also slightly late. So once again, I'm sorry, but uh, I would uh, I would move uh, to the next uh, speaker. <laughs>